Coming up, a couple of viewer questions on diesel. Bit of physics in the beer garden for you blue singlet wearers. You know who you are. That's next. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands off their brand new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. Let's get straight to it. I may be a bit behind the times diesel technology wise, but I think diesel's pretty much always ran lean, as there's no obstruction or butterfly valve in the intake side of things. This would mean diesel engines always run lean unless you work in the engine hard, in which case you're close to max fuel delivery and thus close to stoichiometry. So there should always be the extra oxygen for the DPF to do its regen voodoo when the engine's under low load. Please correct me if I'm wrong or just out of date. Okie dokie. Yeah, definitely wrong. Times two. So at least you are consistent. Well done there. A lot of people suggested this about leanness and wide openness, so let us talk about that, shall we? In theory, okay, diesels do not need throttles because performance is regulated by the delivery of fuel and they run wide open, as it were, on air. More fuel, more performance, okay? Less fuel, less performance. That's how this works. The air intake, unrestricted. That's diesel, in theory, okay? Pretty different to petrol, which is throttled on air, and that's how this works. And in practice, that's how it works for many diesel engines. But quite a few modern diesels also actually have throttles that are ECU controlled. So sort of throttle by wire, by computer, if you like. And what that throttle does is make it easier to manage the exhaust gas recirculation system. So if you introduce a vacuum into the inlet air plumbing by closing the throttle on one of those modern diesels, that makes it kind of easier to introduce the volume of EGR that the engine needs. Less competition for the flow, right? It's just easier. And I know there's gonna be a bunch of dickheads in the comments, you know, saying, what a bad thing EGR is, just delete that, mate. It's shit, that kind of thing. If that's you, if you want everyone to know what a Muppet you are, just go right ahead, knock yourself out, hey. It's a free country, hashtag Australia. EGR, in fact, makes engines more efficient and it reduces emissions. So EGR is a good thing on balance, provided the engineers in R&D do their jobs properly. And I guess also removing it is illegal. So there's that. And the fines, if you get caught, are monumental. This notion, okay, that no throttle equals always running lean, that is frankly insane, even though I get the thought process that leads people there. Unrestricted air, well, it must be lean. I don't know. If you run a diesel engine too lean, temperatures are gonna spike and NOx emissions go through the roof because that's just what happens. Ask Volkswagen. They did that experiment globally, intentionally. It was in all the newspapers, you might recall, in about 2015 and every day since. Fuel economy increases if you do that. That's kind of good. Performance increases, also good. But the air gets a lot more toxic. Bad, I think you'd agree. Just to dive a bit deeper into this lean and rich thing, okay? Diesels can run rich or lean despite having no throttle whatsoever. The mixture is completely unrelated to the absence or the presence of a throttle. So think about that for a moment. In a modern direct injection diesel, here's what happens. The thing that enters the cylinder on the inlet stroke is air, and sometimes it's air mixed with EGR. Fuel does not enter on the inlet stroke. It's completely unlike a port-injected gasoline engine. The inlet valve eventually closes during the cycle, okay, because that's what happens. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. You know, you need the inlet valve to close for the squeeze. <laughs> then there's a compression stroke. That would be the squeeze. And up near the top of the compression stroke, somewhere up there, carefully worked out by a bunch of enthusiastic propeller heads, You've got this charge of hot, compressed air 
and maybe some EGR mixed into it, okay? And at about that time, very precisely at about that time, propeller head determined, the injector is going to fire off a series of precisely metered fuel delivery pulses, which are going to spontaneously ignite because of the conditions, the pressure and the temperature inside the cylinder. That's why they call it a compression ignition engine, okay? And the amount of fuel delivered is absolutely precise, right? It's brain-bendingly precise, given the speed that all these things happen at. The thing that determines the richness or leanness of the mixture is how much fuel the injectors deliver. And that is entirely up to the propeller head dudes who write the code for the engine control ECU. They can write it lean for particular operating conditions and they can write it rich for others and stoichiometric for others still, okay? It depends on the conditions and the objectives and frankly, it's all up for grabs in R and D. It can be rich or lean or stoichiometric. The absence of a throttle has absolutely no bearing on the amount of fuel in the mixture. I've recently fitted a snorkel to me 80 series. While dismantling the Toyota intake plumbing, it seemed at least to me that they go to a lot of trouble to avoid water droplets getting into the air filter. So when looking at the design of my safari snorkel, it seems to be severely lacking in similar design. I am now chastised for having my snorkel intake facing to the rear. I am told I will lose performance by not getting the ram air effect. This has not swayed me in any way as I believe ram air does not have any effect until speeds exceed 160 k's an hour. 100 miles an hour. America. But water getting into the engine may have a detrimental effect on my diesel. Good pub argument material, I frequently lose. Am I right or wrong? Barry, <laughs> Barry, Barry. It's fair to say you are wrong, mate, and therefore... You loose. The ram air effect is bullshit. Even in racing, the purpose of a forward facing scoop is overwhelmingly to swallow cold air, not to act as a form of de facto forced induction, mate. Your 80 series is turbocharged, right? So unless you introduce a restriction into the inlet air plumbing, what you do on the upstream end of the inlet plumbing, upstream of the turbo, is gonna have very little tangible effect on performance. You won't be able to feel or measure it. A Little bit of rain getting in could even be beneficial. Like, turbos run really hot, okay? The latent heat of vaporization of the water would therefore increase the density of the air as it gets pumped up in the turbo, and that's not going to be a bad thing, I think you'd agree. It's hardly as if you're going to hydraulic the engine with rain, okay? That's not going to happen. Face the air intake any way you want sideways would be fine, and that'd be different, but it's not going to make any difference to the way the engine runs or drinks air. Being chastised by mates in the pub, I mean, you love it. We all do. Aside from boobies, what else is there that one can count on? Your research of the facts and your analysis are excellent. But IMHO, your presentations are diminished by the crude, constant reference to dicks, dildos, and your references to and demonstrations of sexual acts as metaphors for business bastardry. It's so over the top, it's not funny, and the crudity overwhelms your otherwise enticing and incisive commentary and becomes uncomfortable to watch. And at times, it sounds sexist and demeaning to women. Maybe you think you're catering to your target audience. It's not only blokes that buy cars, Jack. Really? <coughs> My cock and I, <coughs> we repudiate your allegation without reservation, especially, <coughs> especially you. He takes that kind of thing very seriously, very seriously indeed. Me, I'm more of a live and let live kind of dude, even when it comes to assholes like you. Now, look, I know I'm getting older, but I cannot remember the last time 
I actually demonstrated a sexual act on this fine channel. No. And I really do think I'd remember a lapse of editorial judgment as monumental as that. It would stick in one's mind, apart from anywhere else, wouldn't it? I'm surprised you left out boobies, Alan, frankly, because I do mention and depict them rather a lot. I mean, I, I just can't help it. And as to the phrase sexist and demeaning to women, that's tautological in a practical sense and certainly redundant these days because in our fucked up and increasingly woke society, I'd suggest it's impossible to say anything that could be construed or criticised as being sexist and demeaning towards men even though, I suppose, this would clearly be an example of achieving true gender equality, which does not yet exist, mainly as a consequence of latent, unacknowledged discrimination against men. So there's that. I actually get quite a few emails from chicks who tell me that they enjoy these reports because at least I'm authentic and not politically correct, and certainly not one of those dickless metrosexual muppets who might as well be as engaging and androgynous as a shopfront frigging mannequin. These female correspondents on the channel, they're obviously women who realise that a big fat chunk of these reports is satirical in nature. It pains me to point this out to dipshits like you, Alan, however necessarily. You might want to look up that word, mate. Satire. Just for disambiguation, though, your overall argument is bullshit. It's a classic straw man bullshit argument. Because if you take satire seriously, any satire from anyone, it becomes an easy proposition to defeat by way of argument much more easy than to address any of the points I am really making in my reports, asshole. So with all due respect, which would be none, frankly, piss right off and watch something else. There's a concept. In time, I assure you, I will get over the trauma stemming from the void left in my life caused by your departure from the comments feed. Look at that. I'm over it now, yes. Finally, Alan, I'd suggest get laid. Potentially, even with a woman. But not the inflatable kind. Not pneumatic Nancy or bendy Wendy. However simple this proposition seems in the moment. That might ratchet the uptightedness down just a few notches, mate, to the benefit of us all. It usually does with me. However, temporarily. 